Ano mo ako anong kali? Es eskrema. Ano mo siya ang kali? Arnis. Alam niyo po ba kung ano yung kali? Kali. Ang inamin. Kali? K-A-L-I. Kali? Alam niyo mo kung anong eskrema? Eskrema. Something pang... Eskrema, parang may... Arnis, alam niyo. Hindi yung stick ay, stick yung stick. There are some Filipinos who don't even know that we have our own martial art. If the Indonesian has the silat, the Philippines has the Arnis, or Kali, or Skrima. When you talk to a Filipino who will learn Arnis, you're not talking about the martial artists, but you're learning the culture. This is our very own. Before I set out to film this documentary, I knew very little about the Filipino martial arts or FMA. I knew about the stick fighting part and that there were three different names by which it went. Arnis, Eskrima, and Kali. I always thought it was just a sport and had no idea that it was originally a blade fighting system. Many have claimed that Eskrima was used by the natives of Cebu to defeat the Spanish during their first wave of conquest of the Philippine Islands in 1521. I've heard stories that Kali, the so-called ancient mother art of all FMA, originated from the Srivijaya Empire and that the Muslims in Mindanao are the current keepers of this deadly fighting system. Some have mentioned that the most iconic figure in the martial arts world, Bruce Lee, was trained in FMA and that a lot of Hollywood action films have featured the Filipino unarmed combat techniques. Others mention that various military and law enforcement systems around the world have taken up the blade fighting components of the Screamer for their combat training. I wanted to find out if any of this was true, so I visited as many instructors and practitioners of the Filipino martial arts as I could. It was a two-year journey that would take me around the Philippines, to America, and to Russia. My name is Jay Ignacio, and this documentary is about one of the greatest cultural treasures of the Philippine Islands.
always see the blame. It is supposed to remind you of how your forefathers defended your land against conquistadors. When you practice FME, you're consciously and deliberately drawing upon an image of your past. There is a particular image of the past that we want to revive and bring out into the present. And what exactly is that image of the past? The difficulty in researching the Filipino martial arts is that there are no surviving documents that could pinpoint their exact origins. Unlike the European sword fighting styles from the Middle Ages, there were no manuals written for the Filipino martial arts before the 20th century. The archetypal image for FMA is that of a certain Visayan warrior from the 1500s, and many practitioners like to trace their FMA roots to him. Very little is known about him and the fighting system he used. What we know is that in the year 1521, the explorer Ferdinand Magellan met his death at the hands of Cebuano natives led by a man named Lapu-Lapu. This is where the fact ends and the arguments begin. It is said that Lapu-Lapu and his men were skilled in a fighting system called Kali. Some call it Eskrima or Arnis. Some say that it originated from the Srivijaya Empire and then later on developed throughout the Majapahit Empire and that this is the mother art of all Filipino martial arts. But there are some academics who have a slightly different perspective on the matter. Trade was the main relationship between us at the time, the polities, the political units of the time, in connection with the Sri Vijaya and with the Majapahit. Whether the FMA came from this is another issue entirely. Because there have been claims that the various styles of the FMA could be traced to the Sri Vijaya fighting styles. But we have to look at certain things. First, what did the Sri Vijaya fighting styles look like? If you want to look at, let's say, this movement comes from this culture, that movement comes from this culture, it's going to be very difficult to do. They cannot be recorded archaeologically. You find remains of metal weapons and tools, but you don't find evidence for how they were used. Just the tools. So there's no way to reconstruct the usage. You can make inferences, you can make guesses. So, sa kampilan, ito ay uh, parang mumurahin o simple lang na terasong kahoy, dalawa. Uh, gumagamit sa tali. Ng, ng uh, tali, uh, ratan, so Let's take a look at some of the terms used for FMA. They have Arnis, you have Kali, and you have Eskrima. Interestingly, between these three, the word Kalis, Kali, is probably notably close to an old term for sword, Kalis. It exists in both Bisaya and in Tagalog. In some documents, the S was dropped and it was called Kali. But Kalis is a generic term for skill in swords. In much the same way that one of the old Tagalog terms for skill in weaponry was called armas. Magaling sa armas. O magaling mag-armas. Meaning arms, weapons. Which is the term for arnis. Arnes is the Spanish term from which the word arnis was derived. And that's the Tagalog pronunciation of arnis. Eskrima is the more overt 
Spanish term that was integrated into the different Philippine languages, including Bisaya, including Ilonggo, including Tagalog, etc. The term they use in my time, they used to call it Sandata or Pananandata, the use of the training with the, with the, the weapon. A lot of people refer to it as estoki, estocado, estoque. Others refer to it as friley. But the reason why we use kali because uh, Flora Villabreo told me that's the word we should use. And it's, there's been a lot of names for what we call the mother art. He was probably the most uh, dominant figure at that time in the Filipino martial arts. We use kali because we were taught it was called uh, ka, coming from the word kamut and Lee coming from the word Lee Hook. So it means hand motion, or what it basically means is body motion. Anyone who takes up the Filipino martial arts will surely notice the presence of Spanish or Spanish-derived terms to describe techniques and movement. Counting with uno, dos, tres, and so on, Words like angulo, fraile, estrella, abanico, and spada y daga, to name a few, are used in almost all FMA systems. Having been a Spanish colony for over 300 years, it is inevitable that Spanish words would be incorporated into the Philippine languages. But no matter how indigenous the Filipino martial arts are, could the Spanish actually have made a significant contribution to them? In the book Cebuano Escrima Beyond the Myth, the authors Dr. Ned Nepange and Celestino Macachor stated that a lot of techniques in Escrima came from the Spaniards. According to their research, around the early 1600s, the Christianized Visayan Islands were often raided by the Moro pirates from Mindanao. In order to respond to these raids, the Jesuit priests and soldiers taught their brand of fencing to the native warriors. The blend of indigenous fighting techniques with European fencing resulted in what they called in those days Eskrima. To look at the origins of FMA as we know them now, we go back and then we go forward. In going backward, you would find that you'd have people who are known for their skill in movement techniques. So, magaling siya sa ganitong ano, gumamit ng sandata. Now, the FMA that are known by different styles is probably more recent. These are phenomena that happened in the 20th century. And you see, one reason would be one group of people decided to differentiate their teaching from another group of people. So they needed to put a label. Ito pakicheck na lang, Jay. Ano? Okay. Pagkaya ta sinabing uh, Filipino martial arts, ito ay kadalasang nagpapatungkol sa Luzon at Visayas. Mm. Dahil yung martial arts ng mga Moro ay parang silat, ah. tawag nila. No? Ah. Parang hin, sa kanila ay hindi yung FMA. Ah. Uh, siguro hair splitting ito pero meron silang parang ganong distinction. Mindanao is an interesting set of scenarios for martial arts development because most of the indigenous groups have their own fighting styles. Some of the Muslim groups are well known for their silat and the indigenous form, which has a combination from Chinese influence called Kuntao, from the Tao Sub. The Maranao are supposed to have their own Kuntao as well, and so do the Manobo. Most of the other groups call their style Silat. And what happens here is that there is a constant cross-fertilization of ideas and concepts as practitioners become friends with one another and train together or share styles with one another. Some of them are very exclusive handed on within the family. Others are a bit more open, but only within the Muslim community. And others reach out to the non-Muslims who are interested and allow them to learn. But maybe only up to a certain point because the main reason being, you'd have to become a Muslim convert to learn other things here, which have to do with spiritual practices. So you see, that's a very, very uh, complex scenario. It's the Visayan styles that have been very, very well known, that have been aggressively promoted abroad. That doesn't mean that you should discount the Luzon-based styles. They've always been there. Okay? But you know, maybe because of possible just historical circumstance, the Visayan teachers found themselves in a position to spread their art globally and took advantage of it, naturally. But you cannot say that they evolved from only one place. Nor could you say that there was only one mother art. This is a very controversial issue. Okay, why? 
Because there was no such thing as a mother art during that time. There was skill in movements, skills in techniques, but a, a universal mother art common to all the Philippines? That's not possible. You have so many different versions of martial arts going on at the time. The Filipino martial arts is a blade art primarily. The stick really was a way of training for the blade, so you don't bang up your blade that took somebody so long to get extremely sharp and you're going to need in battle, so you use the stick instead. And then, of course, there is a stick fighting art that you can actually use to hit and all. You start with a weapon in your hand and you work backwards to the empty hand, and I found that so fascinating. When I started Filipino martial arts, and immediately they put a weapon in my hand, I was like, yeah, this is cool, I love this. For me, out of all the martial arts I've tried, it's one where I've been able to learn a lot in a short space of time. Whether or not that's because I've had a great teacher, I don't know, but I also think it's, the, it's withholding the weapons and the techniques and the drills involved. We're demonstrating something from the lightning arnis. This is also a reflection of how stick is supposed to have come from sword techniques. So this is what you payong. This is strike number one. From here, and you hit him here at the kidney or here at the elbow. Notice that I keep a certain distance for me to be able to manipulate my stick. Here, even here, this is pretty strong because if you go full blast here, and even this, a thrust here, can still do enough injury. And then here. In close range, there are three major styles. One is what we call the corto corbada. When you strike, it just mostly uh, snap, snap. And then the other one is what we call the traditional linear striking, like it blade. And the third type of closes is what we call the San Miguel style, which is the closes but accentuated by wide, deep, and very low stance. The first screamer that I ever learned was the San Miguel style, 1946. Before they did the night day. There was too much rivalry in the game. One club was more club fighting another club. There was too much rivalry. So there was a time when the master had a meeting. He said, why not organize only one of the fighters to avoid the uh, friction among the Timorians? So it was decided that they had to form another good, big organization to do the party. Together with the Saavedra clan who founded Doce Pares, the Cañete brothers became the foremost escrimadores in Cebu. By 1952, tension between the Cañete brothers and a faction led by a man named Anciong Bacon was at its boiling point, and this led Bacon to start a new organization called Balintawak. For decades, it was the biggest rivalry in Cebu, which produced some of the best instructors we have today. Bakon was the grandmaster of Balintao, but formerly number two man of the Sipari. When Juri Sabedra, the number one master, died during the war, was created by the Japanese, was the guerrilla fighter. Bakon became number one. When the Balintao was organized in 1952, the grandmaster of that during time is Bakon, Binancho Bakon. I started in Filipino martial art in Palintawa in 1952 at the age of 14. I am the remaining original uh, member of the Balintawa. To touch the hands, but do not allow your opponent to touch your hands. Touching the stick, hands, but they cannot touch. Because this time, boom! You do one strike, there's always a corresponding answer. One strike, yeah. one counter. But at the same time, we are also training the footwork. Mm. Yeah. Here, I can sweep. I can sweep. Okay, use the bat here. Move that from here. Everything is natural movement. Very natural, simple, and direct. Even the range is so close. Enough to touch him and enough to touch me likewise. 
and to push. Okay. Right, don't move forward. Yes. Pack, move. See the body. Feel it. You got to be creative. Down, sir. You got to be something that can, you know, imagine things, how, what, how to do it. Move. Stay at that range. Now 93 years old, Supreme Grandmaster Kakoi is the last remaining member of the original Dosipadis. Even that organization was not spared from rivalry among family members, and he and his nephew Dionisio parted ways many years ago. He now runs his own Kakoi Dosipadis World Federation, and to this day continues to teach his unique style that won him many Eskrima doers back in the day. I can buy my screen mom to do so. And this thing. Now, before the war. Then, after the war, that is good. That's the start of my hero. Hey. Oh. While Dose Pares and Balintawak were busy fighting for dominance in Cebu, the Japanese systems like Judo and Karate overtook Eskrima in popularity in the Philippines. And so some of the local masters felt the need to change the way FMA was taught. They codified the Filipino martial arts into one system so that they could be accepted in the public school curriculum. To make it, revive it, and to keep it safe and intact, some of the masters of ARNIS decided to introduce a curriculum based on physical education needs. That's why you have modern ARNIS. The person behind Modernese was my dad, Remy Amador Presas. They started their first school in Negros. And eventually, we opened a school in, in Quiapo. And uh, during those times, there's more pe people enrolling in karate than in Arnis. And one way of getting people to uh, get interested with, with Arnis is by combining Arnis and karate. They are only enrolling in karate, but they end up studying Arnis. The modern FMA takes part of its inspiration from karate and judo the adoption of a ranking system, the creation of a school name, the creation of a school uniform, creation of an administrative structure including IDs, testing fees, and rankings, grandmaster, senior master, master, instructor, the use of belt ranks. These are the modernized foreign martial arts. He listened to my mom and my mom suggested, why don't we modernize the way you teach the artists? And then uh, instead of hitting the hand, uh, the suggestion was, why don't you hit the sticks? And because of that, we have ended up uh, gaining a lot of uh, people enrolling to our school in Quiapo. <laughs> Professor Remy Presas was very explicit about his desire to see Arnis preserved through the public school curriculum. And in that respect, he did a very good job because what he did introduced Arnis to a wider range or a broader base of Filipinos, many of whom decided they wanted to go on and learn the more traditional styles. It's sad to say that uh, he did not really get that uh, recognition that he was looking for when he was still around. When we look at the modern history of FMA, no matter what your style comes from, even, even me, you know, I come from Lightning Arnis, you have to recognize the contributions of one of the innovators of the modern FMA. And that's Professor Remy Presas, because his modifications to make it acceptable in a public school curriculum has also resulted in the growth of the modern versions of sport arnis, which is one way of making it uh, even more widespread. This is still modernis. One. Among the highest ranking instructors in modern Arnis is Rodel Dagoo. He teaches at the Luneta Park 
on Sundays. Ilangan, if you learn how to swing, how to produce power for strike, like that, pim, go, 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 ding. You see, you see the movement, like that, there, there, there. You see, yung kaliwa mo uh, means for grabbing, pushing, catching. Itong trabaho nito. Pag kinas mo pila, I think, pan. I think, pan, pan. Pan. Check, grab, the luck. You see? Then, ito yan. Alright, pwede yung masalit yan. You see? Nakukuntro mo eh. How about this uh, double sinawari here? If we have this a single sinawari, we go to the single sinawari here, but we have to pass. Practice the pass it down. Bam, boom. Now, you do this also in the double stick. And from the back, you add this. The black here, the back system. The brothers Remy and Ernesto Presas are known as the founders of modern Arnis. At some point in their lives, they became bitter rivals. While Remy continued to use the name modern Arnis, Ernesto renamed his group Combatan. The acrimonious parting of ways between the brothers, along with the Dos Pares and Balintawak rivalries, is just one example of the animosity that is prevalent among FMA practitioners. But there was one man who tried to unite as many warring factions as he could. His name was Roland Dantes. Roland was a key figure in Filipino martial arts, I think. Um, I met him in 1983. He was still very active in bodybuilding, had very big arms. A very friendly guy introduced me to, to a few people. He was the closest friend, the compadre of Remy Presas, uh, while he was in the Philippines and also when he was in America. But Roland through his film and acting career, made friends with many, many people. And he told me stories like when he played a master or a grandmaster in the movie and that was screened in the provinces and he was there, that after the filming, you know, the real grandmasters were in front of the Simon cinema, sort of, so you want to be a grandmaster? And he told them, I'm just a medium to make you known, make, put you in the right position where you belong. So he had the ability to be friends with everybody and not offend anybody else. So he was sort of um, a mediator between different styles because he was friendly, had good context to all styles, even to styles that are not friendly with each other. Through him there was one person they both could talk to and relate to and I think he was more or less the only person because all the other people, masters, grandmasters, come out of a certain style and of course they are for their style. That's no, very normal. And he was above styles. I mean, he came up in modern Arnis, but his political s position within Arnis uh, uh, in the Philippines, he was not representing a style, but he was re representing the Filipino martial arts. And he, he sort of brought people together in Arnis Philippines and also through the camps and through the teaching he did. And also through the v movies, of course, he, he made it popular and made people aware of Filipino art and artistic fighting and, and, and so on. So I miss him a great deal. He was a good friend of mine. He stayed in my house uh, two or three times. Um, and um, it's a great loss that he, that, he got here, that he went last year. Despite you have achieved many things, despite you may be famous or you may be rich, you know, it doesn't make you a better person. Every person is the same, really, and, and just letting other people feel, hey, you, are, you as a white belt are as valuable as a sixth or seventh down is. Um, uh, and uh, I always say, just because I can swing the stick a little better than you doesn't make me a better person or a better character, right? But this doesn't mean that, that I have the right to be arrogant to the people was very much a leading figure for, for this kind of uh, dealing with people, which, which I, I think is the right way. You have to remember, there's Filipino heritage and there's Filipino American heritage. Because those Filipino Americans that had came over pre-World War II some of them were residing in California. So that heritage was preserved and was being preserved here in the United States, in California, in Hawaii, and in Stockton, California. I got into the martial arts because it was my heritage. It was my, my culture. My father is Dan in Osanto, and my honorary uncle, and I guess you could say godfather, was the late Bruce Lee. So I have been born and raised around the martial arts world my whole life.
he is known as Guru, Sifu, or Tuhon. Whichever title people wish to call him by, Dan Inosanto is one of the world's most influential martial artists. Through his seminars and collaborations with popular martial artists, he was able to introduce the FMA to the movies, television, law enforcement, the military, and even the National Football League or NFL. But the turning point in his life was when he met an unknown martial artist from Hong Kong. The uh, first international karate championships were held in, in 1964 in Long Beach. And I was a, a, a black belt under Ed Parker at the time. And I uh, was sort of like his liaison man. And he says, there's a Chinese man by the name of Bruce Lee. He's just a young boy and he's gonna be coming in. And I would like you to just sort of take care of him. Here's some money, make sure he eats properly. We became very close friends, and so he started to show me a little bit of his, I call it his system or his understanding of martial art. I told him I'd really love to study with you. She says, I'm gonna be three weeks here in Los Angeles, and I'm gonna be demonstrating at the Sing Lee Theater. How would you like to assist me in demonstrating at Sing Lee Theater for about a week and a half, he says. I will teach you the things that I like to do or my method. And that's how our friendship started off. So I started studying with him all that time period from 1964. And then we just became a very close friend. He was definitely my closest friend at that time period. This is the drill. It's very common drill. You're going to have the hand tap, tap, and just the feet. When I lift it up, you need to point it. Because the putting range is when you do all the knee and the off balance of the body. Okay? I think it's Stick fighting, I showed it to him and he learned it's Tom single stick and double. And then we started to experiment with different things and we sparred with it a lot. He didn't want to learn the basics. Okay, we just try to hit each other. That's, that's, that's his format. And let me see what you do from there. Then that's how we did a lot of things from there. And uh, brilliant from that, from that aspect. I think he really liked the Philippine martial art, or else we wouldn't have sparred so much. And because of in Hollywood, he'd always make these foam sticks that we could do it. See, there was no protective gear. That was a drawback to the Philippine martial art. The first generation did not have armor. People got hurt. That's why it was never popular. As Kendo, the Japanese were smarter. They had headgear. See, <laughs> right? Now the Philippines use headgear. But at that generation, it was a thing of manhood you're not manly if you put a headgear on, but that's the way it's a drawback. It goes like that one, two, three, four, five. The truth is, Dan and Asano studied so diligently with all these different people going here and there, Stockton, so LA, and any place he could go to learn. And he would bring people in for seminars. I've gotten to train with so many Filipino martial arts masters because Dan and Asano paid for them to come to the academy and teach. His energy got it out there. And then people saw what it was and then, you know, took off like wildfire because people see that it's just an incredible art that's been hidden, not known. And once it's seen, people just fall in love with it. Let us honor Maestro Dan for his contributions in making the FMA, the Filipino martial arts, known in the Western Hemisphere. Because without him, this would have been just simply some obscure fighting method. But he built on his association with Bruce Lee and he took and incorporated the methods of analysis for movement, martial movement taught to him by Bruce Lee into the FMA. And the nice thing about Maestro Dan is that he has often been open about promoting people who teach FMA, giving them the recognition due and encouraging people to study under them. That makes him a rarity in the martial arts world. Filipino martial arts were part of Jeet Kune Do, and it was introduced to him through uh, Dan and Asanto. And uh, I know that Bruce Lee, through his own studies, uh, looked into, of course, a screamer, but Sikaran, you know, it's, it's different Silat styles. It, it's, it's in there. Bruce Lee had it right, and the best way for him to introduce the art to the world, or the arts, would be through cinema. When Dan Inosanto came into Bruce Lee's life, he introduced him to more of the empty hand methods of Filipino martial arts and the stick work, in which it's evident it's in his movies. A lot of people like to date the nunchako back to 
the Japanese, and actually that's not Bruce Lee's background with the nunchaku, it's Tabak Tayak from the Filipino martial arts. You know, he was, he was training Filipino martial arts. We call it Tabak Tuyuk. The Okinawans call it nunchucks. I started to show him he liked that. And first when he looked at it, he said, that's a worthless piece of junk. And I said, why don't you use it? So I showed him how to move it, left it. And then I think he became very proficient. And he said, you know, this has good play. I think I'll use it in the movies. I've had the chance of coordinating a decent amount of film now. I've produced several movies. And Jeet Kune Do has been a big part of every one of them. You know, I might feature a little of other martial arts in it, but when we get into it and I want it to look, the look and, and you know, I want that gritty, mean, aggressive fight to come out, it's, it's Kali, it's Filipino martial arts. In my own personal belief, it is the most advanced weapon-based system I have ever seen. It'd be nice to go like that. So if it was Brad here, you go, whoo, he backs out, you stab him. I don't think the general uh, movie-going public necessarily knows they are perceiving the Filipino martial arts because, let me tell you, there are a lot of stuntmen that use it. They'll do the martial arts, but they change the expression of it so it almost looks like it's Chinese or it might look like it's Japanese, but they're watching Filipino martial arts. I would say a great majority of the, uh, the Hollywood films that are made now, when they do fight scenes that they want to look very impressive, they use Filipino martial arts. Now, they might say, oh, this guy was some, you know, he was a, a ninja or he was some secret, you know, special forces guy. But when they actually do the fight scene, Filipino martial arts. Mm. But unfortunately, very rarely do you hear in the film, oh, this guy is studying the Philippines, you know, when he was a kid or something. So the Filipino martial arts doesn't get that much credit for what you see on, on the screen, right. but it is there all the time. It's very common, and yet people have no idea that's what they're seeing. And particularly here in, in, in American culture, there's a tendency to think that all martial arts are the same anyhow, so they don't understand what the difference is between Korean and Japanese and Chinese and Indonesian and Filipino. They kind of think it's all one thing. Uh, I work with Steven Seagal, um, and he has a Filipino martial arts influence, even though he's the Aikido guy. A friend of mine trained him for quite a few years before his movie career. Mm -hmm. So there's some of that. That's why he actually had uh, Tuan Inosano come in for a fight scene because he respects the Filipino martial arts right, so, right. so much. When Bruce Lee's movie Enter the Dragon was released in 1973, a lot of martial arts movies have since then been produced in Hollywood. Some of the most spectacular FMA fight choreography can be seen in movies such as The Book of Eli starring Denzel Washington and The Bourne Trilogy starring Matt Damon. The man responsible for choreographing these incredible fight scenes is Jeff Imada, one of Hollywood's most successful stunt coordinators and longtime student of Danny Nosanto. Through Danny, he introduced me to, and I've been very fortunate to be learning all of the concepts of Jeet Kune Do. But when I first started with him, I remember he said, uh, I'm going to start this Filipino class, Filipino martial arts class, and I think you should take the, take the class. I'll never forget that. And, and I was going, oh, really? I had never really heard of that much about the Filipino arts. But I said, if you want me to take the class, I'll take the class. So I was very fortunate that he asked me to take the class. And to me, it's one of the best well-rounded arts around. And it's very much helped me in the studio work, too, because there's so much influence in the Philippines from all the different cultures and different styles that, uh, you know, you learn a little bit of movements like Tai Chi. Dos Manos, which, you know, for like samurai style and, and all these different styles, you know, Spada Yudaga and everything. So there's influences from all the cultures from all over the world. So it, it expands your appreciation of the arts, makes it possible for you to, you know, have that and then research the other styles even more so because you're introduced to it from one, one base, basically. I've always been interested in spreading Filipino arts because I think it's been something that hasn't been seen very much by, by you know, by most people and, or, you know, the general population. And I'm glad that it's getting its, you know, that it's being noticed now. I mean, um, on the Bourne films, you know, Matt Damon even would even refer to it like, you know, this is a, a lot of Kali that we're doing in this. It's really 
it's really great. So I think it's been well overdue for a long time. You know? So it's uh, plenty more stuff to be seen. Jeff is a, is a great guy who I get to see here and there um, and, and movies that I do. And um, I think fights are exciting. It's a dance. It has to be in sync with your partners. You know, it has to be choreographed. And that's why Jeff Imada was so good. As an audience member myself, and as someone who really enjoys film um, and movies, I want to be able to believe the character. I don't want to believe the actor. I want to see the intentions of the character, not the intentions of the actor. So I never approach doing fight choreography with a sense that uh, um, teaching them choreography first. Whenever I do it, I teach them a style of fighting which matches their character. Now, I, I, and I go into detail into telling them, part of your style is Taekwondo, part of your style is Filipino martial arts, part of your style is Hapkido, according to the character. You know, one of the things I try to do when I did Avatar was try to incorporate some Filipino movement or some, um, tribal, something unique, exotic kind of movement, so it makes it more authentic and more different, you know what I mean? So it just depends on the project and stuff like that, you know, every project is kind of different. When you think about what kind of martial arts people are, are most made aware of, it's on screen. It's amazing. I mean, you can get movies on your phone in the Philippines. What are you going to be seeing? What are you watching? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if someone could actually make a movie using the Filipino martial arts and introduce that on a much bigger level to even bring it all the way back home to the Philippines. My name is Daniel Coronda. I am a martial arts enthusiast, specifically a Filipino martial arts. I was born here in the Northern Philippines. I teach submissions using the art of Boltong. Boltong is the Northern Luzon or the Igorot art of fighting. It is basically just like Dumog. It's like uh, the native wrestling in, in the north. Oh, oh. When I was in elementary school, I joined the cultural dances. And this is the first time I ever learned about Filipino martial arts being first as stick fighting. It is only in the later part of my elementary days that I learned that these are all blade-related moves. Pumasok na si Leo Gahe sa buhay ko. Si Leo Gahe improved kung ano na yung dati kong background. Siya ang nagbigay sa akin ng light to see uh, the loopholes in Filipino martial arts. He's a great influence. And so dito ako tumagal, dito ako nagbabad. Pekiti Tercia is Leo Gahe's expression of Filipino martial arts close quarter combat. Leo Gahe is one of the pioneers of Filipino martial arts in America. In the 70s, he founded Arnis America Organization. And then later on, it became Pegidi Tiosi Arnis. And together with Tuhon Bill McGrath, they established Pekiti Tercia International. In 2005, uh, I was in Thailand. I met a couple who happens to be an officer in this Pets Nuts. Uh, I shared a few moves. I invited them to come over to the Philippines, train with me. And after this, they appreciated so much the invitation and they invited me back to Russia. 2005, the first time I went to Ekaterinburg. 
a few months after that, uh, I was invited again, and this time in Moscow, to teach uh, officers. From there, sunod sunod na siya. Yung invitation ko, hindi na tumigil. It's the first time they ever experienced Pekiti Tirsi. And then most of the Russians that I talked to, iisa sinasabi, you are the first Filipino martial artist that we met. And I'm proud, no? At uh, uh, nagmarka ako doon. So this is how it all began. And ngayon nga, up to this point, with the help of friends, lumaki na siya and it has become an organization in Russia. The Filipino martial arts were already in practice when I arrived in Russia. Ang problema, the FMA Russian masters learned from non-Filipinos. So I was the first Filipino to live in Russia to teach Filipino martial arts. And because of this, in 2007, binigyan ako ng parangal ni Ambassador Llamas ng Philippine Embassy in the Russian Federation. I had heard from uh, Tony Inosano that seven of his instructors, because he researched so well, seven of his instructors, the very first lesson was, they said, angle one, hit me angle one, and as he hit, they moved back and smashed the hand. And he's writhing in pain. And that was the first lesson seven times because the point was, if you don't understand what it feels like to have that hand hit, you won't really respect it so much. You're like, okay, I don't want to do that. I want to do all that other stuff. But they really made the point that, no, you have to know the hand hit. So here I am in Paranaque, in a shanty town, in this little tiny shanty. And Grandmaster Lavaniego says, hit me angle one. I'm like, oh God, here it comes. So I went, <clears throat> went <clears throat> like this. And he blocks and comes back and boom, and the stick comes and like stops less than an inch from my skull. I'm like, okay, I'm still alive. Great, he goes, angle two, I hit him angle two, same thing. He goes, boom, like this, and the stick just goes, and stops right there. And after that, I knew, oh, I'm gonna be okay. But that was my first experience. And again, talk about generous, just wanted so much to actually let me understand the art and, and get to experience the art. The target is even okay? Bah! You see? I hit you there. Oh! You see? Ang panaksak ay hindi lang parang saksak. Mayroon din tinatawag na pagsaksak mo gano'n, umiislas. So, may pagsaksak din namang umiislas na gano'n. May pagsaksak din na umiislas. Umiislas, uh, yung gano'n. At ang galaw ng katawan mo, in and out. O, pag gano'n mo, hop, o, oh, yun. O, gano'n ka, o, uh, gano'n pa rin. Gaganong ka? Hup! Oh, yun, malakas yun. Yun, pak, pak! Yun, hup! Oh, yun, oh, hup! Oh, pak! Yan, mga kwarto. So I'm an instructor with Tuan Inosano. Uh, I've, uh, I am an instructor with, uh, under the Illustrissimo group. I, but you know, I don't go out and actually teach Kali Illustrissimo because I think there are people so much better qualified, I don't think, I know, <laughs> like uh, Master uh, uh, Tony Diego, Master Christopher Ricketts, uh, but I did get to study with uh, Master Ricketts and Master Diego and uh, Grandmaster Illustrissimo. I had the privilege to learn from the best. Grandmaster Illustrissimo is considered as one of the best street fighting styles of the Filipino martial arts. If you've seen him in action, he was an 82, 83, 84-year-old man in Luneta. 
hitting men one-fourth his age straight into their heads every day, day in and day out. It amazes me how this fellow can do it. The beauty of his style is it's all, his strikes are all direct to the point. No flowery motions. His is, if you strike, he strikes you first. He hits the straight line. So his principle is a straight line approach in most of his strikes. What was it like learning from him? Ah, uh, di puro sakit, puro tama. <laughs> Dahil tang baro pag pinalo ka ng ganito, papapak, tirahin ka niya. Mag-iba ka lang ng konting-konting angle. Pag tira niya ulit, iba na naman tingin ang papakita. Kasi medyo may edad na rin si Tanda na nakilala ko, nasa 80 na eh. Nasa 80s na siya nun eh. Master siya talaga. Talaga magaling siya. Makikita mo sa tape, di ba, tinuturuan ako. Palo, ako ng ganito, palo ng ganyan. Basta puro sabi niya, palo. Pero hindi niya sasabihin, bakit ka ganito? Bakit ka ganyan? Basta, Palo ka ng ganito. O, oh, to, palo ka ng ganito. Basta rumiha ka na. Oh. Super was very much in love talaga with the Justice Mo. And I, I really mean that from the heart. Talaga, he was really in love with it. He loved the way it looked. He loved the way it, uh, it's the philosophy behind it. It was perfect because it was first and foremost a fighting art. You will not say the form you practice is a little bit different when you use it in sparring. No, it's the same thing. I have the free flow. 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 I have I was a national uh, lightweight taekwondo champion of the Philippines from 1982 to 89. After uh, my career as a national team player, uh, joined the movie business, did a lot of uh, martial arts movies. Tuper had a big influence in us learning the Filipino martial arts and learning other styles than just limiting yourself to that style. You know, although I believed in that because I was a big fan of Bruce Lee, but I never met anyone who practiced what Bruce Lee was saying here in the Philippines until I met him. The statement of Bakbakan was always, Bakbakan is not a style nor representative of any style, but it is a center for learning. In Bakbakan, when we came in, we came in to learn many things. I came in knowing that later on you'll be doing weapons. But I came in knowing that later on there will be a portion that you will be doing boxing, Thai boxing, there's a portion that you will be doing Kung Fu. So that was the big difference I think with Bakma. It was a great honor uh, for me to learn with these great masters. I mean, of course, I just wish they were still here with us today. Now, parang like we're scrambling to remember what we were taught. So we're really trying to uh, learn with the people who have learned from them the best. Like Master Tony, Master Tooper, Master Yuli. So now they're our go-to guys. Na now, parang we're craving for that. Ang alam ko lang talaga na tunay na nakakaintindi niyan. Simple, simple lang. Ako, Yoli Romo, with his own version. Tapos, Tony Diego. Yan. Ah, Master Tony. It's very quiet, but when he moves, he speaks volumes. I don't know if that if if that makes sense. He doesn't say much. Actually, just like Tatang, uh, they won't say much until they move. Tatang Ilustrisimo was both feared and respected as an escrimador. His exploits around Cebu. Mindanao and Manila were well known as he was involved in several death matches. He was reluctant to teach his system to anyone for fear of others using it against him. But by 1975, at the age of 71, he finally gave in to the persistence of Tony Diego and Yuli Romo. While Tony chose to preserve Tatang's style, Yuli had added his own interpretation and is known for a very stylized system he calls Bahad Zubu. Bahad. 
Ito sumpra. Ito sumpit. Yan, sumpit. Target, hindi ganito kung ito pa rin. So, extend. Extend. So, X pa rin. So, walang ganito. Ito pa rin. Oh. Extend. Bakit? Para makalundag ka na. At trash. At saka. Extend. Back in the day, when we were competing, Master Yi was a, a, he would train. He would train winners, pare. He would train champions. And let's face it, Master Yu Li's stable, they all were champions. Impressive. All. Pare, impressive. Time. Everybody he trained was a medalist. Everybody. My initial entry into the martial arts was with Edgar Sulite. I had a chance to meet Edgar when I was 15 years old, together with Master Tupper Ricketts. And he saw me as a young man that was starting my martial arts career with Master Tupper. And he spent lots of time with me, patiently spending lots of time with me. And I used to wonder why we did things repetitiously. We used to do one motion, one movement, 1,000 times until my hand was raw and I never could understand why and you know when I started competition I realized he was right all along because if you keep repeating the motion it becomes second nature so even before you can think of doing it you're already doing it so if it's a block or a strike he made the master only 10 moves 10 moves nothing fancy all the moves that he taught us for the tournaments were all simple straightforward death blows strike Abaniko, strike, strike, abaniko, strike, strike, abaniko, strike, strike. So it'll be uh, very natural in a tournament. So if you will strike me. Now approaching the third and final round, and this is where the action starts to explode more. If we keep just going, we're going to just keep going. Antonio Tatang Illustrissimo, the legendary swordsman from Bantayan Island in Cebu, who stowed away on a ship that he thought was bound for America, ended up in Mindanao and honed his skills there while under the protection of a Moro warrior. Later on, he moved to Manila to work as a foreman at the pier and died there at the age of 93. He lived and died a poor man and was buried in an unmarked grave but the rich legacy he left behind has been one of the most influential in the world of FMA. His system lives on in his students and their students, who now propagate the Illustrissimo name around the world. Is there any other native art from our country that has the same effect or impact as our martial arts? Frankly, no. Where Filipino martial arts is concerned, I like the martial of it and I love the art of it. And the Filipino martial arts is different. You become your own artist and you make your own song. Most people that are doing any type of knife defense or stick defense, they're studying Filipino martial arts. Everybody's got their distinct style, but when put on the spot and you have to react, you have no choice but to move or be hit. I mean, especially with a stick that's coming in over 100 miles an hour at you, there's no time to think, you just have to be in the moment. And sometimes Filipino Kali is more Jeet Do than Jeet Kune Do is Jeet Kune Do. <laughs> the Filipino martial arts, it can be all encompassing in the sense that you have to know who you're teaching. Then the knife is more effective because now when I cut and I come around, I can control and hide, push the knife in. In the United States, it is part of the defensive tactics program we're teaching law enforcement. When it comes to military combat units, it is part of their combatives. So you have the combatives where the threat level is very high in the military. You have the combatives where it is a little bit more controlled with law enforcement. And with the civilian life, you can turn it into a, shall we say, self-defense or other believe a martial art. 
but also in the college level where we teach the program, it is a wellness course. See what's happening here? This is a hip, hip control point, right? I used to be a, a deputy sheriff in Chicago. I've been in some riots. I really truly believe that I wouldn't be walking right now hadn't I had the Filipino martial arts in my life. I will say this. I know I will practice this art to the day I die. Why is it one of our greatest cultural exports? Precisely because it is something unique. It's dynamic, it's fast, it's fierce, it captures the imagination. At the same time, it is also not one of our greatest cultural exports. Why? Because of the way we package it. In another time and age, when discretion was a necessary part of survival, it didn't matter. But in a contemporary setting where we're using FMA for more than just fighting and self-defense, when we're trying to use it, explore ways to use it as a form of cultural identity, then we have to pay attention to the packaging. Not to say that it's going to be looking exotic, but rather, we want it to look good. Most people thought it was only a poor man's art, or an art used by criminals. I think the Filipinos need to come out and push their culture. Because look what Bruce Lee did for Kung Fu. Right. You had Chinese, you know, popping their collars, feeling really good about themselves because you had someone that was representing their culture and saying, this is ours, mm. this is what we do. And if we are trying to impart that Filipino martial arts can be our Filipino culture, then what are we saying? Filipinos are knife fighters or we're just stick fighters or we like violence? No. It shows you that you can use the art to give you a discipline so that what we give to other people is part of our culture where we as a people are loving, caring, Philippines needs to create an organization or an, as, uh, or an association to, to develop and to promote the Philippines martial arts. And with no internal conflicts and uh, without the goal to make money, but just the goal to, to promote, to develop the Philippines martial arts and to open the Philippines martial arts to the world. Under the International Modernist Federation of the Philippines, or IMA, we hold regular camps, training camps, seminars, six big activities annually inside the Philippines, and one world festival every two years. We go around the world to hold seminars and, and, and conduct trainings all over the world. We have this organization that is committed, not for commercialization, not for the purpose of personal gains, but to push the martial arts, especially us. We are not selling the martial arts, we are selling the Filipino culture. We have our way of sustaining our costs. We manufacture equipment and we export it. Indirectly, we are part of the Philippine economy, helping bring in dollars for uh, our economy. A portion of the profit from this goes to the maintenance of the Federation. We do not impose uh, membership fees. We do not receive uh, private funding. We do not receive uh, government subsidies. None at all. Whatever style of uh, FMA that one would study, in general, I would say that go for any FMA that you'll be interested with, regardless it's Balintawak, it's Dose Pares, Kali Ilustrusimo, or Sirada Escrima, you know, all of them are good by itself. The only thing that would find that one is go to a good teacher and eventually could guide you in becoming a better arnisador. Learning Cali de Leon as a whole is basically means you have to be a good person. You gotta have an honor, you gotta have an integrity, you have to have respect for yourself first so others can respect you. It's not about killing. Killing means nothing. It's not the way of life in Cali de Leon. You are my students, you have to be better than me. And you can only attain that, of course, with my help and with my patience and with my understanding what your ability to do. We have empty hand fighting. We have grappling. We have a use of weapons in understanding. That's how I think Kali, why Kali all over the world is accepted even more because it was taught that way. When I, I begin to teach the policeman here for a special unit here, at the beginning they, it was a Filipino martial arts. So, because most of them uh, never get exposed to their own martial arts. When I explain to them, most of the technique I, I just show you, I just teach you, come from your country. And they were uh, surprised by that, because they, most of them did not know about that. 
at the same time, they were very proud of that and, and grateful because to be exposed to their martial arts and that a foreigner can expose them to their martial arts and show that their martial arts are very efficient. It's spread now all over the world. And lots of people are, are doing this, doing their own research. Some are starting to, to change the name. So you don't want to wake up one day. The, they call it European stick fighting. What has happened along the way is that people learn the skills. These skills are easily picked up. And now people will say they teach FMA, but what is their connection to the Filipino culture that spawned the FMA? That's an open question. Because there are so many foreign-born FMA teachers who have not yet stepped foot in the Philippines or experienced the training in here in the local cultural setting. Sad to say. It saddens me to note that in the Philippines, hindi siya sikat. Mas sikat siya sa abroad, no? Uh, and you yourself, particularly, you've seen that even in Russia, the special forces there, the Spetsnaz, utilize our Filipino martial arts for stick and, and knife fighting. In order to revive the Filipino martial arts, the late Grandmaster Roland Dantes realized years ago that political will was needed. And so, together with several lawmakers, he co-authored a bill that would declare Arnis, Kali, and Eskrima as the national sport and martial art of the country. It took the Philippine government almost 10 years to sign the bill into law. But finally, in December of 2009, Republic Act 9850, otherwise known as the Arnis Law, was finally passed. Uh, the passing of the law is very important. Arnis, the martial arts itself becomes an institution. There may become a national program. Under that law, uh, the government must put funding in it to push the martial arts. More and more people in Europe, in the US, are interested by Philippines martial arts. But here, they can disappear, I think. If master train only in their backyard with five students, if the student after don't want to continue to teach, the system will disappear. And I think maybe a lot of old system disappear because of that. And all of those old people that our grandmasters have died or is dying nowadays, they don't even get any help from the government. These are the cultural treasure of the Philippines. I hope that, you know, with the enactment of the law in, uh, in the Philippines regarding Arnis Kali or Skrima as the official martial art or sports in the Philippines, I hope that it will change. These grandmasters are getting old. These grandmasters are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. They're dying one by one. Uh, nobody wants to take over the, the, the arts from them. They're running out of uh, heirs to their styles, and that's what we don't want to happen. Hahayaan ba natin sumama sa kanilang libing ang natitira sa kultura ng Filipino martial arts? Chasing after these masters for two years, I realized that they only want to be recognized for all their hard work. They spent most of their lives propagating our very own uniquely Filipino martial culture. With these masters acting as our cultural ambassadors, the world has come to respect Filipinos and have the highest regard for our martial art. That says a lot about us as a people, and we do not have to look too far to find heroes. It is because of these masters that we have a cultural identity. In the end, it is up to us Filipinos to keep our martial arts alive in our own backyards and to continue what our masters have started centuries ago. It is also up to us if we will allow all of this to just fade away. After all, the Filipino martial arts are only as important as we want them to be.